Our opening words this morning are by Carl Seberg. Let there be joy in our coming together this morning. Let there be truth heard in the words we speak and the songs we sing. Let there be help and healing for our disharmony and despair. Let there be silence for the voice within us and beyond us. Let there be joy in our coming together. We, the members and friends of the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House of Provincetown, welcome you to this congregation. We pledge to be a safe and supportive community that respects who you are and affirms all that you can become. Cry with us, laugh with us, work with us. Together we seek the highest good. We are glad that you have found in us a home for your spirit. You may be seated. This prayer is by Karen Bellavance Grace, also for Veterans Day. Meister Eckhart said, if the only prayer you ever say in your entire life is thank you, it will be enough. Today we set aside time to say thank you to our siblings who have served in the Air Force Army, Coast Guard, Navy, and Marines to say thank you to all who served, whatever their role, wherever their service took them. We say thank you to those whose service was brief and to those who made a career of their service. We say thank you to those who remember their service with fondness and to those whose time and service still haunts them. We say thank you to those who returned to us largely intact, who found jobs, started families, and who continue to find ways to serve their communities. We say thank you to veterans who returned with brokenness so deep that they continue to struggle to find a role or even a home in our communities. God of many names, source of all love. In the face of all this, sometimes the only prayer we have is thank you. We pray it will be enough. Amen. I thought we might need some good words to use to reflect on the election last week. When the last campaign ad has aired, when polling stations are closed and the count has been certified, when pundits and politicians have turned in for the night, and pollsters and political operatives are turning their thoughts to the next big race, the work of citizenship remains. To care more for the marginalized than for the profit margins. To be mindful that quality education is far less expensive than mass incarceration. To insist that military intervention is a last resort, not the preemptive prerogative of the powerful. In short, to know that our true wealth is the welfare of all beings and the planet that we call home. Thank you, Aaron. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Unitarian minister James Vila Blake wrote these words for the church he served in Evanston, Illinois in 1894. Blake was a Harvard graduate, a Unitarian minister, a poet, and a hymn lyricist. We are not alone in having used his words as our congregational affirmation. Many churches have connected with them and his words, this affirmation, is featured in the back of our hymnal. In fact, why don't you open to that now? It's number 473. <clears throat> Say 
So at the bottom left. And while you're there, scroll up to the top of the page there to number 471. This used to be our affirmation. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve human need to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with God. These words, first published in 1933, are credited to L. Griswold Williams. You can put your hymnals down. <laughs> I just wanted to show you where they are. So Williams is much more our sort of guy, a universalist, not a Unitarian. He was at Meadville Seminary until he was kicked out for his support of striking Italian factory workers. He was a conscientious objector, but served in a non-combatant role with the American Friends Service Committee. As part of my search for truth about just when we started using our current affirmation, I went through piles of old church documents this week. It was really fun. I found an order of service from 1945, at which time we didn't have an affirmation, but we did say the Lord's Prayer and offer communion. I'm not sure when we started using Griswold's words here, but we did until at least the late 1970s when Reverend Richardson Reed was the minister. And I'm not exactly sure when we switched to Blake's words, but it appears to be sometime in the 1980s. When I was little, I learned a little hand game that went like this. It's hard to do backwards, but here is the church. Here is the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. I'm not alone. <laughs> There's a tricky balance when worshiping in an old place like this. You want to honor and preserve the history of the place, but you don't want the people inside to be preserved. You want them to go on moving and squirming and seeking and changing. You want the faith inside the church to be a living faith. And so it is a sort of balance of preserving the liturgy of the past while making sure worship is still fresh. A balance of capturing the poetry of the ages while making sure that the words spoken this week have deep meaning for those who are listening today. Recently, we've had some conversations about our congregational affirmation, both in committee meetings and in private conversations, and at our congregation-wide talk soups. This is the Blake affirmation I'm speaking of now. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. At first we addressed this because there was discontent by many people with the word law. As we dug in there though, we found that some people were also uncomfortable with the word church. Then as we played around with different wording and structure, people felt that we were losing some of the poetry of the original. And we could never seem to get the wording of those first two lines quite right. Love is the spirit of this church. <laughs> and service is its law. I love my worship committee. <laughs> but you know, last year when we began to take a look at the language of the affirmation and make some changes, we were not the first. 
Maybe it won't surprise you that hundreds of other congregations of Unitarian Universalists have also wordsmithed these very lines. My friend from Divinity School, Lucas Herger, wrote this one for his church. Love is the doctrine of this church. Our faith in each other is its sacrament. Working for justice and living with compassion is its prayer. Reverently, we covenant together to stand on the side of love, to heal and not to harm, and to share hope with each other and with the world. In Wilmington, Delaware, they say, the search for truth is our constant star. In Cheyenne, Wyoming, the UUs gathered there say these words on Sunday morning, Love is the spirit of this church and service its cause. This is our covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek truth, and to help others. At my church in Boston, I became accustomed to speaking the affirmation in Spanish. El amor es el espíritu de nuestra congregación y el servicio es nuestro regalo. Esto es a los comprometemos convivir en paz, hablar nuestras verdades con amor y ayudarnos los unos a los otros. I like history. I love poetry. So I understand why some people get uncomfortable when we start changing words that have graciously lived together in an affirmation for over a hundred years. But it helps me to know that the words of the two historic affirmations that have been important to both sides of our family tree, the Unitarians and the Universalists, will always be there for us, right in the back of our hymnals, with attributions to their authors. I also understand that intentionally looking at something that we don't all agree on, but that we feel strongly about, can be a little daunting, especially for those of us who don't relish conflict. But here's why I think it's worth us spending time on our affirmation and covenant, why it's worth disagreeing and getting frustrated and then coming back to the subject again. It's because how we go about choosing the words that we say each week is just as important as the words we say. And how we are actually being together in times of disagreement is even more important than the promises we're making in the affirmation about how we plan to be together. So I want you all to know how deeply you have been heard by the worship committee. For more than a year now, we have spent time at our meetings sharing what we've heard from each of you about words that are important to you or don't work for you. And we've looked carefully at each word in the affirmation. Let's do that together now. Love is the spirit of this church. Well, right off the bat, we run into trouble. As I mentioned, it's that word, church. Now, I didn't realize how much trouble this word would be because I love the word church. I grew up in a Unitarian Universalist congregation, and so church to me meant this great old building full of history where you went on Sunday mornings, but also during the week for potluck suppers and talent shows, where you sang together and worked for justice together and learned about world religions and composted in the backyard, and had youth group sleepovers, and played sardines, and found the best places to hide in the dark. In seminary, I often wasn't comfortable with the worship services, and I had a lot of arguments with people over words like God, and atonement, and sin, and about what it meant to be an inclusive church but I never felt like I was arguing from outside the word church. I just felt like I was working from within the church to change some things. And I was being church in a different way that made sense to me 
and stretched the imaginations of those who had a more rigid view of what church meant. I still feel that way. I like to say things like, I'm sorry, I have to go. We're having drag bingo at church today. <laughs> Or, this Sunday at church, we are celebrating Hanukkah. What we've heard from a lot of you, though, is that church isn't the word that best fits for you, especially some of the humanists and those with Jewish backgrounds. And those with heartbreaking backgrounds in conservative churches feel that the word is a loaded one. You prefer congregation, which means an assembly of persons brought together for common worship, or community, which is a group sharing common characteristics or interests, or residing in the same place, or having a common cultural and historical heritage. Another word that seems comfortable to everyone is meeting house, which describes a building where religious and sometimes public meetings take place. The meeting house was often the first structure to be built in each colony as America began to take shape. And in England, a meeting house is a nonconformist or dissenting place of worship. We all seem to like that. We love to dissent. And service is its law. Many of you don't like the word law. It feels like a harsh word an admonishing word. It makes it feel to many as if we only give our service to the world because we are required to from on high. Okay, so let's forget law. What does service mean? It means that giving to others is somehow at the heart of this place. That using our time and energy and skills in the service of others is part of this faith and this community. But this is also reflected in another line, to help one another. To me, service means how are we going to act this whole affirmation thing out? So what's important about service, helping one another, isn't how we are saying it, it's how we are doing it. So let's not spend too much time disagreeing about the second line of our affirmation and how we frame service. Let's be of service. Let's act out the affirmation. Let's help one another. It seems like a much better way to spend our energy. And it's important too to look at the words that have that we have all seemed to agree on. This is our great covenant. What is a covenant anyway? A covenant is a living, breathing thing. It's a commitment, a pledge, a promise, an understanding, an aspiration. To dwell together in peace. These lines don't mean that we will never disagree or that disagreement is bad. But it does mean that when we disagree, we'll talk about it. To take some language from the playground, we'll use our words and our indoor voices. It's not just that we won't tolerate violence, it's that we will use the instruments of peace to create the spirit of this place. Understanding, forgiveness, compromise, goodwill. Seek the truth in love. We aren't here to be told what the truth is. We are here to seek truth, to be an active participant, to continue learning, exploring, wondering, doubting, seeking. And we will journey toward our truth with the understanding that each other person here is doing likewise. Seeking the truth in love means that we respect one another's journeys. Even if our beliefs differ, we can support each other's search. We are called to do so by our covenant. 
and to help one another. We could all be religious seekers alone, but we aren't choosing to do that. We're choosing to seek in community, with support, with people who share in our joys and sorrows, and with the blessings of community comes responsibility. We need to look out for each other, be of service to this place and to one another. And one another doesn't just mean who is in this room. It means reaching beyond our four walls to be of service to the community and to the world. It means recognizing the interdependent web and knowing that our connections extend far beyond this meeting house. That one another means everyone. So now we've explored the words more deeply and we are left with what, when they are all strung together, they mean for us as individuals and as a community. Reverend Victoria Safford says this, Every Sunday in my congregation we repeat in unison the affirmation that the Unitarian minister James Vila Blake wrote in 1894. Love is the spirit of this church. Each week, quietly, aloud, I promise that I will dwell in peace, she says. And then, I don't live peacefully at all. By Monday afternoon or Tuesday at the latest, I'm living fearfully again, or acting meanly, or self-servingly. I say that I will seek the truth in love, she says, and then I proceed to act quite otherwise, closing my ears and shutting down my open mind and heart, seeking instead the validation of my own narrow, safe opinion. I say our great covenant is to help one another, and then I forget to do it. So Victoria takes comfort in the hymn we often sing, based on Rumi's words, Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, Ours is no caravan of despair. Come yet again, come. And she reminds us that one of Rumi's lines doesn't appear in our hymnal. Though I have broken my vows a thousand times, come yet again, come. Our challenge is threefold to come up with words that speak to most of us most of the time, to live out these words, embodying them in our human and imperfect way, and to return to them when we forget. As to the first challenge, if we had a creed, I could just tell you what it is, but a covenant must come from the community the living, breathing, changing community. So here is what has arisen from this congregation in recent weeks as your worship committee has listened deeply to you. Love. Is the spirit of this meeting house. This is our great covenant. To dwell together in peace. We can come right across this whole front. We can stretch. To seek the truth. In love. And to help.
one another. As to the second challenge, to embody these words, I leave that in your hands. And for the third, to return to these words again and again, we can help with that. So let us say together, love is the spirit of this meeting house. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. May it be so. Amen and blessed be.